Hi guys and welcome to the first True Crime video on my channel. Now today's video is going to be about the hair fetish killer, so aptly named because of his obsession with women's hair. He was convicted of killing two women, although it's speculated but not confirmed that he's killed many more. I've watched two documentaries and I've, wa I've read several articles on this case to try and get put together the most accurate information that I can. Now I'm going to tell the case in the events that they happened, however just bear in mind that a lot of this information didn't come out in the UK until many many years later. Now Daniela Restivo was born in Sicily in Italy in 1972 and not long after his family moved to a small Italian city called Potenza that's been described as quite far out, not just geographically, but also culturally. It's a very religious society. And Restivo's family were quite well respected in the community. His father was a director of a branch of local, of national libraries, sorry. And so his family were very well respected and very well protected in the community. Now, I couldn't find much on Restivo's upbringing, but I did find out that he was a bit different, a bit weird, and he didn't really fit in, and he's very awkward, especially around women. Now, when he was 21, Restivo developed an obsession with a 16-year-old girl called Alyssa Clamps. Alyssa was a good, kind-hearted family girl, the youngest of three siblings, an honor student, and a devoted Catholic. And she'd confided in friends to say that Restivo was becoming a bit of a problem. He wouldn't leave her alone and he kept making advances. And so one day, Restivo asked if Alyssa would meet him at the local church, which was the Most Holy Trinity Church. And she told friends that she felt a bit sorry for him, but she just wanted to go to make it clear to just please leave her alone after this meeting. And on the 12th of September, 1993, the two met up at the Most Holy Trinity Church. And at some point during their meeting, Restivo tried to make advances on Alyssa, who rejected him. And so he killed her. Her body wouldn't be found for another 17 years. Her family had to go 17 years without finding out what happened to their daughter, or where her body was, which is just so heartbreaking. Now there's some quite interesting points in this case. First one being that, uh, apparently, according to different information online, the police investigation was hindered because of the family's connections with the police. It's widely believed, although not confirmed, that because of the family's position in society, that the police investigation wasn't as thorough and wasn't as good as it could have been. And also, the second point is that where Alyssa's body was found when it was eventually found, was in a loft area of the church and there was only one key for this loft area and the only person that had access to this was the priest at the time which was Father Domenico Sadia and again it's thought that the priest may have helped to cover up the murder or at least given Restivo the key to this room because how else would he have got her body in there? But the priest did die in 2008, so he took this information to the grave with him. We'll never know whether he did help him or not. So when Alyssa didn't return home, her family became very, very concerned, and her older brother, Gildo, went down to the church to see if Alyssa was there, but obviously she wasn't. He then, then rang the Restivo household, and the family told him that Restivo had left the city to go and do some university work. They didn't know where he was and when he would be back. At the time, Restivo was studying at the School of Dentistry uh, in Naples. The family decided to report the crime to the police. However, the police state that there was no urgency in this case. They believe that Alyssa has just run away with a mystery boyfriend. Uh, and about this time, conspiracy theories started to come out about her disappearance. Apparently there was a diary entry ripped out of her diary and people started to spread around rumours that an Albanian gang had kidnapped her. I'm not going to go into any more detail than that because I don't think it's very relevant to the case, but if you are interested in that, I do recommend you look it up. 
So when police finally catch up with Restivo, he tells them that he'd left Alyssa praying in the church. The two had met up to talk about a girl that Restivo had fallen in love with and Alyssa confided in him about a stalker that he had. And when police asked him about an injury that he'd got on his hand, he told them that he'd had an altercation with Alyssa's stalker who was outside of the church. And another piece of information I found, although it's not in any of the reports or any of the documentaries, but it is in a couple of articles I found, was that apparently Alyssa went to the church with a friend to meet with Stevo, um, and this friend ended up testifying in a murder case when her body was eventually found. Although this has never been said in any really mainstream media, so I'm not sure how true that is or not. Now, there were several things in this case that police missed on. Shortly after her disappearance, Alyssa's family got an email from Alyssa saying that she'd moved abroad and that she was happy and not to worry about her and not to contact her again, which was very out of character considering that she was a big family girl. And so police eventually uh, tracked this email and realised that it was sent from an internet, internet cafe in Potenza at the same time Daniello Restivo was in that internet cafe. So he'd sent the email to her family. Apparently Restivo was obsessed with chasing young girls. He'd take them behind a curtain in the church to an upstairs room and he also stalked people that rejected him. He called loads of girls up after they rejected him and played creepy music down the phone to try and scare them. This was all about power. He wanted to install fear into his victims. Eventually, Alyssa's family and the entire community started to suspect that Restivo had something to do with Alyssa's disappearance. And so he realised that he couldn't enact his strange obsessions. So in 2002, he moved to Bournemouth in the UK and met an Italian woman on a dating site. They, not long after this, moved in together. Now this woman was an older woman, she had a disability, and their relationship was very strange. It was described as being more of a mother and son relationship than a boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. She looked after him, she cooked for him, and she cleaned for him. At this time, they lived opposite 48-year-old seamstress Heather Barnett, who was described as a feisty woman with a great sense of humour who loved her children with all of her heart. Six months after moving in, Restivo approaches um, Heather at her home on the 6th of November 2002 and he asks her if she can make a pair of curtains for his girlfriend for Christmas. And later on in the investigation, police note this as being very, very strange, a very weird Christmas present for a girlfriend. Just six days later, on the 12th of November 2002, Heather would be found dead by her children. She'd not long returned home from the school run, dropping off her two children, 11-year-old Caitlin and 14-year-old Terry, when she got a knock on the door. It was with Steve-O, and obviously she invited him in because he was a client of hers, and she thought he'd come to talk about the curtains. Heather did all of her work in a back room and so they went through to the back room and Restivo tried to attack Heather with a hammer. Police noted that there was an obvious struggle, uh, things were knocked over and the altercation ended in the living room where Restivo repeatedly hit Heather over the head with a hammer and fractured her skull. Police said she would have died not long after this. But he wasn't done there, and this next bit is very graphic, so just a warning. He dragged her body through to the bathroom. He cut off her breasts and placed them behind her head. He cut a piece of her hair off and placed that in his left hand, in her left hand rather. And in her right hand was a random woman's piece of hair. And this hair has never been identified, they've never found out who this hair belongs to. But Restivo bought someone else's hair to the crime scene with him. 
He then butchered her body with a pair of scissors and left the body for the children to find on purpose. When Heather's children returned home from school, they couldn't find her and it was 11-year-old Caitlin who found her mother's body first. And outside, as they were screaming for help, to add insult to injury, Restivo actually brought his girlfriend over to comfort the children while the police arrived. It's just awful. Now, when the police arrived, police noted that it, Restivo was acting very strange. He was very quick to tell police that he'd got a very good alibi and it couldn't have possibly been him that had killed Heather which police found was very strange, and I find that strange too. I mean, these children have just found their mother dead. The last thing they're thinking about is you doing the murder. I don't, I don't know, it's just, I just find it so sick. So police begin their investigation, and Restivo's alibi actually adds up at first. He says that he was at a computer program for unemployed people at a local centre, and police check, and he was there. Now, at the crime scene, they say that there are bloody footprints uh, that lead to the living room, but they don't lead out of the house. Restivo had actually bought a spare change of clothes with him and shoes and changed into them in the living room before leaving. He also bought a green towel with him, which had two profiles of DNA on, but at the time, uh, they couldn't separate these profiles of DNA because DNA testing wasn't as good as it is now and so that they couldn't figure out whose DNA was on this green towel. All they knew is that this green towel didn't belong to Heather and it was brought in by the killer. When police began to suspect Restivo, uh, they revisited his alibi and realised that actually it wasn't true. He'd altered the times that he'd gone into this centre to make it look like he'd gone in earlier than he had. And then police found CCTV of him at a bus stop near Heather's house, which I will attach in now. Police decide to question Restivo, and in the first documentary I watched, they said that he played on his uh, lack of English at, in the interview. And when they searched his house, they found a pair of trainers soaking in bleach, but again, because of the DNA technology available at the time, they couldn't retrieve any DNA because of the bleach from these trainers. Six months after the investigation started, a police officer finds the information about Elisa's disappearance and Restivo being connected to this. But again, this was still not enough evidence to prosecute him for Heather's murder. Just want to apologise very quickly before we continue. I had lighting problems, as you probably noticed, so sorry for the change in position and lighting. So, in from 2002 to 2004, Restivo cut the hair of 15 women, including a school child uh, who was just on her way to school on the bus. Uh, he showed no scare... No, he wasn't scared. He showed no respect for these women. He would just cut their hair. I um, felt someone pull my hair uh, and actually quite hurt. So I turned around and um, saw him and said, ow. And he said, sorry. Um, so then I moved my hair over like this. And um, I noticed that my hair was coming out um, and going on the floor. And then I turned back around and he quickly ran off the bus. In March 2004, police de decided to do some surveillance on him. So they bugged his house and to see if he would talk about Heather or her murder. He didn't, but the police did get an idea that he was obsessed with women's hair and had a fetish for women's hair. Now, in May of that year, they decided to follow him. And on this particular summer's day, it was very, very hot. He went to Throop in the countryside, which is on the edge of Bournemouth. And he was acting very, very strange. Police said there was about half a dozen dog walkers, um, female dog walkers. And Restivo was hiding in bushes. He was running around. It was very, very hot, but he was wearing his hood up, he was wearing gloves, two pairs of clothes. Uh, it just was a bit bizarre. And so they sent two uniformed officers to confront him. 
He explained away the two pairs of clothes by saying that he was just exercising and that he wore two pairs of clothes when he was exercising because he'd sweat more and it'd make him lose weight more. But then police searched his bag and they found a balaclava, a pair of gloves, two pairs of scissors and a knife. He said that he was collecting grasshoppers, uh, which police found no evidence of. It was just all very bizarre. But still, it wasn't enough evidence to take him to court for Heather's murder. November 2006, police find a clump of hair tied together with green string in receiver's bag. He explains this away by saying it must have been planted there, he can't have possibly put the hair there. Police then decide that their best bet is going to be to try and find out who the hair belonged to that was left at Heather's murder scene. And so they put out a public appeal in Italy and the UK and like I mentioned, although they never, ever, ever found out who this hair belonged to, quite a few women came forward with stories to say that Restivo had cut their hair. In fact, a young woman from Italy came forward to say that in 1993, the same year that he killed Elisa, she was sat watching a film in the cinema and Restivo was sat behind her. He just cut a chunk of her hair out and then calmly walked out with her hair, which is just so weird. Um, and then several women came forward saying that Restiva had cut their hair in public or they'd gone to a hairdresser and the hairdresser had commented they got a chunk of hair missing. But again, this still wasn't enough evidence for the courts. So in 2008, DNA testing technology becomes a lot better and they can separate the two profiles found on the green towel left at the crime scene. And one lot of DNA belongs to Heather, and of course, the other lot of DNA belongs to Restivo. In March 2010, two workmen went up into the loft room where Alyssa's body was and found her mummified remains. She was still wearing the same clothes and shoes that she wore that same day she went to meet Restivo. Police knew these were automatically linked. Both women had hair found in their hand, both women had their trousers pulled down to their ankles, both women were mutilated with scissors. Police believe that not only did he have a fetish for women's hair, he also had a fetish with just cutting in general, hence why he mutilated their skin. It was just to do with power and feeling like he was the one in charge and if you know I can't have you then no one can. So. British police and Italian police worked together on this case and put together as much evidence as possible. And then a jury found Restivo guilty. In fact, it said that some jurors even cried as the evidence was read out because it was just so horrific. And in court, a statement was read out by Caitlin, um, who said that the memory of finding her mum dead will still haunt her to this day, but she won't be a victim. I'm not gonna read out the full statement now, uh, I'll link an article in the description box below that you can read out the full statement for yourself if you want. Uh, so Restivo was given a life sentence and he later appealed along with a few other criminals who'd been given life sentences and he was given a minimum of 40 years before he was eligible for parole. Heather Barnett's brother was upset with this. He thought that it wasn't okay. Restivo should have a life sentence, he said, to sit there and think about everything that he's done to these women. Now obviously police believe he was linked to other murders as I mentioned earlier. This case I really really recommend you look up. There's so many little different bits of information um, that I didn't include because I couldn't confirm whether it was 100% true or not but it's it is really worth looking up yourself. Um, this is just a really, really awful case and I feel so sorry for the poor families who lost a daughter and a mother. So that's it for this case. Please let me know in the comments down below what cases you'd like to see from me in the future. And again, I apologise for the technical difficulties. I'll work on them for the next video.